This is Steve Downs, the voice of Master Chief, Sierra 117, and you're listening to Podcast Unlocked, the world's number one Xbox podcast. Now, finish this fight. Master Chief, out. This episode of Unlocked is presented by Destiny 2 Beyond Light. What's happening, friends? Welcome to Podcast Unlocked, episode 470, the first one in the new generation, the fourth official generation of Xbox. It is November 17th, 2020, as we record this. The usual crew joining you, I'm Ryan McCaffrey, alongside Brandon Tyrell. Hello, good morning. Destin Legary. Bam, hi, everybody. And a very busy Miranda Sanchez. Hi, hello. Excuse me if I look exhausted. <laughs> just, just hammered away on that mechanical keyboard before the before we recorded today. Got to do it, you know. It's uh, yep. it's that time of year. People need their game help, their game guides, and you and your oh, team yeah. are hard at hard at work at it. So we are. Please use our guides. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. If you get stuck, if you need tips, whatever it is, Miranda's team has got you covered with all the biggest stuff. Uh, so real quick, I want to go around the table. It's been a week now. How are you guys liking your Series X and living with this thing? Have you already put your Xbox One X away? Let me go to Destin first on this and, and uh, check in on, on your next-gen experience. I like it a lot. I, I, I'll i probably never play my Xbox One X again. Like, everything works on the Series X. So what? besides, like, for doing analysis or work-related things, I don't think I could see a reason that I would be utilizing that console again in the near future. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. I really like how fast and snappy everything is. It's working well, and I'm very, very happy with the console. Brandon, how about you? Have uh, any any problems? Are you have you have you uh, shelved the One X at this point? Where are you at? No, I I've, I've always had a lot of Xbox consoles in my house because I buy one for myself, and then work sends us one for work. So yeah, I have two Xbox Ones, and I have the same situation with the Series X right now, where I have my work review unit right here. And then my personal one showed up and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. So my biggest problem right now is figuring out what to do with my one X's and then where to put my series X's. I usually have one in the living room, one in the bedroom, but I'll have one in my office as well. Um, one thing I really, really love about the series X though, I don't know if you guys have been blown away as I have, but turning it on takes like half a second. I know. I'm still blown yeah. away by the fact I press the button and literally a second later, the login screen pops up on my screen. It I, Blown it away, takes man. longer. Yeah, it for me, it takes longer for my TV to auto turn on when it detects yes. the HDMI signal and the console's already there ready to go. Yeah. Um, I'm still using my One X though because Apple TV just launched their new app on the Xbox uh when the Xbox Series X came out. So yeah. I'm watching watching Ted Lasso and it is very good. And I enjoy the Apple TV app now. Well, wait, isn't that app's not on the Series X yet? I don't know if it is. I, I honestly, I didn't plug in my Series X yet into my TV area. It's still on right. the Xbox One because I honestly don't use the TV in the living room a whole lot. Yeah. Um. So I just downloaded it on the One X. I imagine it's also on the Series X. Yeah, I think X. it is because it, well, yeah. you know, it was timed alongside the release of the console. It's so. in the Microsoft Store, so I'm, I'm yeah. sure you can download it on any of the consoles. Yeah, exactly. And Miranda, how go how go with your new generation experience? I love the controller i've really enjoyed using it um i've been using it a lot just for getting guide stuff done actually and i've also picked up destiny again because it's that time of year yay and so it's been <laughs> a lot of fun getting back into it and again this controller is just super solid um my xbox one x is going to get retired to my bedroom and we're going to place my original xbox that i've had since launch so it's kind of fun seeing it get this place and i'll probably put it um, it might go to the closet. It might be like the sad Toy Story moment when it's like, oh, my <laughs> friend. <laughs> you will be up there gathering dust. I don't know. That or I might send it to a family member. I'm not too sure yet, but yeah. I am super enjoying it. It's so speedy. I'm mostly still just tinkering around in the settings, though, and finishing up some guides. I hear that. Yeah, I, I officially retired my One X uh, over the weekend. I had finished transferring over the things I wanted to move over and... There's nothing else that I needed from it, so it is. It, it, it for the first time in years, it was removed from that that shelf behind me and and put away. And I do not anticipate uh, busting it out at, 
really I, ever again. Did you, did you give it the full I, honors funeral? The Viking funeral. Yeah, somebody did on a that fire on and Twitter. burned it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I imagine you like goodbye, old friend, and then set it off into the <laughs> just, <laughs> right, like set my hand on well. it, loving, yeah, lovingly. <laughs> no, it was good. Hey, when I first got the the One X. I didn't have a 4K TV yet, so I was I was uh, you know you t just taking advantage of it, but not full advantage of it. So, you know, it's uh, it feels good to to have the full 4K set up now with the Series X, and it is good stuff. Uh, also, good is seeing what Cyberpunk 2077 looks like on the Xbox. All the footage we've ever had so far, of course, has been from PC, and uh, we got just today as we record on Tuesday, a surprise Night City Wire special bonus episode that, that CD Projekt Red put out that's just 10 minutes of gameplay of a mission, the same mission, cutting back and forth on an Xbox One X and on a Series X in compatibility mode, not the next gen optimized full up ray traced edition yet. But um, did anybody have a chance to take a look at that yet by chance? I saw a little bit of it. I yeah. watched all of it twice. Miranda, Miranda, what so what what did you think of uh A how it looks on the One X and B uh even how it's running on the Series X without full optimizations? It definitely there, there's a difference there for sure. It looks like the combat was a little a little clunky maybe on the but maybe not. I think I I, I it's hard because you don't have a good comparison. Yeah. Uh, to the Series X because they actually didn't show any Series X combat. They only just showed you walking through Night City, which I was a little bummed about because I thought if like you're trying to really show off like what this can do, even with just like that uh, compatibility mode, you want to show off that combat and see how much more smooth that it's going to be. And it, it seemed good. I mean, you could definitely see the vibrancy that changed between the two systems, and I'm sure that'll only improve with the full next gen optimization. And I am bummed that it's going to come sometime next year nebulously sometime next year which you know it checks out given the fact that this game got delayed so much right but i'm glad we still at least got our first look on console like what that's going to be like so i am worried if you're going to play this on an original xbox one i will say that yeah yeah but if you have a one x or at least um series x or series s you'll probably be fine and then Destin, you've you've got an eye for this stuff. You've been doing all of our graphics comparison analyses across mm -hmm. Gears Five and Spider Man Miles Morales. So, did anything kind of jump out at you? What did you think of of that ten minute video that they put out? Yeah, I'm taking a look at it now. Um, I mean, it's early, so I won't comment on some of the some of the negative things that I saw really because I got a lot of crap for doing that on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, but there's some minor things that are probably still being tweaked. Uh, the game looks great on either platform. They do a lot of interesting things to make sure that, it, uh, game, like developers will do a lot of interesting things. And I found this out with Spider-Man to optimize for the one X versus the series X or current gen versus previous gen. Um, and, uh, some of the stuff that you notice here, like there's more reflections in the puddles there's fewer on the one x versus the series x mm -hmm. which uh which is interesting seeing there aren't really next gen enhancements uh per your note there ryan right uh but it's still noticeable a lot of people commented on it looking muddy uh just within it, within our internal groups but that might be more due to compression yeah YouTube. of the video than the than the actual you know gameplay that we're witnessing uh, they also drove by like really slowly. Um, I, I think they've probably done the best thing that they can to make sure that it's running the best that it can on the One X versus the Series X. I really want to get in, and where it gets really interesting is when you're able to go to one spot and look at it on a previous generation console, and then look at it on a next gen console. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's like our first pass for our old school sort of style graphics comparisons. And when you're looking at them side by side. Uh, that's where we're going to find some some really, really interesting stuff. I will yeah. say that that's sorry. Uh, that's what I was excited for. It's like I want Dustin's comparison because this isn't doesn't feel like the right comparison that I would have wanted from this. <clears throat> yeah, they they kind of jump between scenes that are hard to correlate. Like, yeah, he's driving a car, but then he's driving a car like in a fairly different location. So 
yeah, I want to get in. I want to see exact locations like that big skyscraper in the distance. Is the draw distance as far on the one X and the series X? So like right now I'm watching about one minute, 21 in there's no cars on the road. And then he jumps to an internal location. Then we jump back to driving on the series X and, and, there are a few more vehicles on the road in the segment that we're watching, but I don't know mm -hmm. if that's scripted, if that's a mission. Lots of questions actually arise from seeing this. Uh, have, have they limited uh, pedestrians? Have they limited traffic? You know, and you know, I'll be able to dive in more once we get more access to the game. But yeah, and and just pretty, to finish pretty compelling up, so far. To to Miranda's point, this seems like a game that. That, yeah, might not. It, it, this one might sting if you're on an Xbox One S or an original Xbox One, uh, much in the same way that at the beginning of the now last generation, the Xbox One generation, uh, Destin, you'll remember Destiny on the on on the 360 and yeah. uh, Shadow of I can't remember if it was the first one or the second one, I'm, uh, uh, but Shadow of Mordor. Uh, whichever one of those two came out that at that point in time, it was it was a decidedly not as great experience on the 360 as it was on the Xbox One. But we'll see. We don't. We finally don't have long to wait. We're about what three weeks out from yeah. Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, all right. And real quick before we get going with the news, a reminder to send in your Yappa questions for the loot box. Again, you don't have to make a Yappa account. Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Discuss, uh, maybe one I'm leaving out. All those you can just sign in with. Leave a video comment, for, and we will feature you on the show. So just leave it on this episode's uh, article page, which is Google IGN Podcast Unlocked 470, and you'll find it. Scroll on down just above the comments. Leave us your Yappa comment, and we will uh, hopefully see you on a future episode. All right, news time. Uh, first story this week, big story, Microsoft expecting Series X and S shortages to continue a good bit into 2021 through the first quarter, in fact. Uh, speaking at the Jeffries Interactive Entertainment Virtual Conference, which is quite a mouthful, and uh, with a tip of the cap to Seeking Alpha for the transcription, Microsoft's chief technology officer, Tim Stewart, was asked about resupplying after series pre-orders sold out and explained that demand is huge right now, adding, quote, frankly, gaming is just exploding, which I saw a lot of people kind of taking issue with that quote, like, what do you mean just now? No, I think he's just kind of referring there to this year, like there's been a spike with with the, the quarantine and things. Uh, so the he says, I think we'll continue to see supply shortages as we head into the post-holiday quarter, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then when we get to the second quarter of the year, which is Microsoft's Q4, but who cares, uh, meaning April, the April to June quarter, says all of our supply chain continuing to go full speed heading into the pre-summer months. So uh, he says we'll have supply cranking over the next four, four, five, six months. And that's when I expect to really see that demand profile start to be met, which will be really, really great. Uh, and that's pretty much that. So, guys, this seems like good-ish news for Microsoft. I mean, it's never great if you're leaving sales on the table, but it's good if you have demand. Uh, but maybe not so great, Brandon Tyrell, if you are a gamer trying to get your hands on a Series X or S console. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's hard. that you. There's not a whole lot to unpack in this one, right? It's just shortages of, of supplies. So... <clears throat> Unfortunately, people are still going that route of buying up consoles they can and trying to sell them on secondary markets. So please don't fall for that. Um, but, you know, just new new supplies coming. So we just have to wait and kind of wait for uh, all of that stuff to be doled out. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do outside of just keep trying. Miranda, we do have in-house ways for people to, to try and uh, take advantage of those stock updates as soon as they refresh. Yeah, so if you follow IGN deals on Twitter, you're going to know when those consoles are back in stock, uh, which I am also following because I wanted to get an Xbox Series S for my twin sister for Christmas, and I'm just kind of like, dang it, <laughs> I might not be able to. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Um, you know, 
It's, it's unexpected for sure, because I think before this, Microsoft was pretty confident. It's like, oh, we've got stock, we'll be good. And then maybe not. So it is a surprise, but it's good to see, obviously, that this is taking off pretty well. But I, I, feel, I feel for all the people out there who are like, oh, I'll just get one after pre-order, it'll be fine, and still doesn't have one, so... Yeah, and, and just for a little historical context, which will be a running theme of, of the next couple of stories that we're talking about, uh, if you think back seven years ago, the Xbox One never really had a demand problem. You could pretty much get one whenever you wanted to get one. Now, the, the 360 absolutely had a big supply problem. Uh, the it was, it was quite tough to get, as I recall it, because I was working at OXM at the time, I want to say it was through about February after its November launch that it was almost impossible to find. You just really, it was very tough to get a 360 for those first three months. And obviously we know how well the 360 did and how relatively not as well the Xbox One did. Uh, so it's that's not to say that just that alone, just the, the launch demand and supply alone are are going to be indicative of how the console does in the long term but it's at least you'd rather you'd rather have the situation that the series x and s have which is too much demand not enough supply than have an xbox one situation where oh that thing's out and okay they're in stock at best buy sure i guess just go over and get one if you want one so uh it's a good start for microsoft uh, real quick, before we get to our next story, which is also Xbox Series X and S related, we've got a quick word from our sponsor. Be right back right after this. The line between light and dark is so very thin. Let's cross it together. Destiny 2's new expansion, Beyond Light, takes you to a brand new location, adds new ways to play your characters, and answers narrative questions that go all the way back to the original Destiny campaign. Let's take a look, presented by Destiny 2 Beyond Light, available now. The day we've been dreading has finally arrived. The darkness is here. Something is stirring up on Europa. Aramis, the Kell of Darkness, is building a new fallen empire on the back of the power of stasis. Taking the form of crystallized dark ice, stasis is a formidable weapon, and the threat of Aramis and her followers cannot go unchallenged. The Exo Stranger, not seen since the Black Garden campaign in the original Destiny, returns to guide the Guardians to Europa, frozen moon of Jupiter. Look beyond the frozen wasteland. Here's where the ultimate battle with the darkness will be joined, and secrets long buried beneath the ice will finally come to light. Stasis isn't just a power used by the enemy. Each Guardian class gets a new stasis focused subclass in Beyond Light. Focus your power. Let it grow. Warlocks can become powerful shade binders, wielding an icy staff that fires freezing projectiles. Hunters have the Revenant subclass, whipping up stasis whirlwinds to control crowds of enemies. Titans can be burly behemoths, protecting themselves with nigh impenetrable stasis armor, shaking the European surface with powerful ground pounding attacks. Of course, no new Destiny adventure would be complete without exotic loot, and Beyond Light has the goods. A new version of the No Time to Explain Pulse Rifle doesn't just return ammo to the magazine when you score a precision hit, but can help protect you by firing bullets at enemies fired by your rifle in an alternate timeline. The Stasis Grenade Launcher Salvation's Grip distributes massive ice sheets across the battlefield, freezing enemies, and the nasty Necrotic Grip turns your melee attacks into a poisonous strike that can spread to new nearby enemies. Beyond Light offers exciting new abilities and gear, plus an epic campaign in which long-awaited secrets of the past will finally be brought to light. Destiny 2 Beyond Light is available now. Play it on Xbox Series X, PC, and other current and next-gen consoles. I will give these guardians the destruction they crave. Hey everybody, Zach Ryan here to talk to you about IGN's new weekly show, The Review Crew. Each week we're gathering folks from all over the gaming community to talk about the biggest and best games. We'll dive deep into each review. It's friggin' awesome about that. All these monks thing. just running away from you it in is every direction. Pandemonium. Yeah. Talk about the things that we loved, the stuff that needs improvement, and probably have some spirited debates and laughs along the way. Yes! No! Yes! No! 
We're kicking things off with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but in the coming weeks, we're talking about Demon Souls, Xbox Series X, Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales, PlayStation 5, and Cyberpunk 2077. You can tune in Mondays on IGN.com or listen to the full audio version later in the week on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast service. Hell, you can do both. I'm not your boss. Let us know what games you want to hear about, but more importantly, let us know who you'd like to see on the show. Until then, you're already in the right place with IGN. Now, speaking of sales of the Series X and S, uh, Microsoft, in a, I know, it will stun you to know that Microsoft says they're doing great. Uh, unfortunately, they don't offer any concrete numbers to back that up. So Liz Hamron, who runs the Xbox Series hardware program, announced in a blog post this week, quote, Thanks to you, the launch of the Xbox Series X and S is now the most successful debut in our history. While we miss the emotional spark of being together with you in person, it was incredible to celebrate a new generation of gaming with the millions on our celebration live stream and everyone who participated in our global launch across 40 countries. Your support and what you accomplished in the first 24 hours of launch inspire us and demonstrate the connective power of play is more important than ever. Uh, they note more new consoles sold than any prior generation, with the Series S adding the highest percentage of new players for any Xbox console at launch. More games played, 3,594 in total, spanning four generations, setting a record for the most games ever played during an Xbox console launch. Uh, and next-gen means more new ways to discover and play. 70%, this is probably, the I think, the most relevant in number in here, because I think I think most of the rest of this is kind of just PR fluff, and I want to hear from you guys here, but 70% of Series X and S consoles are attached to new and existing Game Pass memberships. So seven out of every 10 new Xbox Series consoles sold are have a Game Pass subscription active on them. Uh, Moran, let me go your way first here. What do you make of this, of this uh, announcement by Microsoft? First, good on everyone for getting Game Pass because it only just makes the most sense, really. You just get that huge library of games. Um, second, I agree that it's kind of hard to really wrap your head around like what this actually means because if you're comparing to the Xbox One launch, I God, I hope it was better. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, great. Um, and I think it's it's good to hear. Obviously, again, we we're just talking about availability, right? And how so many of the consoles are hard to find now. Um, but I would like to have those firm numbers just to kind of get a sense of how many people actually did get consoles. Um, but I guess like, again, the only real big takeaway, as you mentioned, Ryan is probably the game pass subscription yeah. quote. Yeah. yeah I, um, think, I think, I think, Brandon, 70, sorry, I think a 70% conversion rate is like astronomical, right? It, it is as good as you can expect for new consoles. And it's sort of Microsoft's good credit. Um, that that service has become sort of what it is now you know it, it is now something that is undeniably a good value a good deal it's arguably the best value in gaming right now i would say um and it just goes to show that if you create an infrastructure right that supports players with good value that you can have a self-sustaining you know service because you know those those game pass subscriptions are going to continue to pay dividends month after month after month so um, the fact that you are selling a Game Pass subscription on 70% of your consoles tells me that Microsoft is set up to do really, really nicely this generation. And, it, you know, this is just the beginning of it. It's going to become more attractive the, the well, longer we go. And, and speaking of that, not only uh, EA Play is now yeah, in there. Yeah. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, a game that came that close to getting <laughs> my, it was probably like my number two choice for game of the year last year. I ended up voting for Control, which won for IGN. Uh, and then the other thing too, I actually didn't get a chance to mention this last week. I'll throw it in right here because it's uh, relevant. You get a, a one month free trial to Disney Plus now as part of your Game Pass mm -hmm. membership. So you can watch The Mandalorian right now, even if you, you know, if you haven't had Disney Plus to this point. So that's just yet more nice value being thrown in as a part of that. Uh, Destin, mm -hmm. your take on this and the numbers or lack thereof and the things Microsoft is saying about this launch. Well, it was my understanding because they tweeted about this and such also, and uh, there's been a lot of just talk about this particular topic. Does this include the Xbox 360? So it outsold the 360, correct? 
Like it's the best console launch in their history. Yeah, I was going to get to that, but yes, uh, the the one of the points I was going to make, which I'll yeah. I'll throw back to you here, is so the Xbox One, obviously its troubles at launch in particular are well documented, <laughs> but it did not have a global launch, and neither did the 360. So mm. this is Microsoft, you know, doing a global launch for uh, effectively, I, I think. Yeah, the first time, because I don't think the original Xbox was a global launch either. So, yes, so that, that is good context for this conversation. Yeah, I, I it's astronomical. It, it must have done phenomenally well, because the 360 was like the console that everybody wanted at the time. And I think it came up before the PS3. Do you remember? Right? A year. Yeah, yeah I remember. Right, yeah. 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 So it, it was the thing to have. It was the only next generation console for a year. Yeah, so the fact that this is, outperforming that period in time and that console is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, uh, kudos to them. And they know that they're going to have console shortages into 2021, referencing our previous story. <laughs> they're doing great. This is awesome news for Xbox. Uh, people always do the comparison to you know the competition. But you know what? Everybody's winning no matter yeah. how you cut it. Very true. Yeah. That's a really good point. And one I wanted yeah. to bring up, I know it is entirely too early to start talking about this yet, but this is the first time, you know, really since the 360 and I, I adopted the 360 later on in the cycle. So I wasn't there for, you know, that first year. Um, I, I think I came in towards the end of the year, but this is the, this is really the first time in recent memory that I can, I can think of where I feel like Microsoft's console, the Xbox Series X and S, and Sony's console, the PlayStation 5, it feels very, like, there's parity there. It feels very yeah. close. It's like one or the other. And and this is based not only on, like, sales and interest, but also, like, reception on, you know, social media, on our own internal traffic that we monitor. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of interest for the PS5, obviously, but there is, I would say, an equal or a... a um, a, uh, a noticeable amount of interest for the Xbox Series X that I feel hasn't been there in five years. I don't know yes. if you guys feel the same way, but it, it almost feels like, yeah, pick which one you like more because there is that argument to be made. They both do different things, but they do them equally. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, you, exactly. Go ahead, Miranda. I just don't want to forget like how important it is that they have the Xbox Series S as well. Yeah. Although it doesn't, you know, do as Gra it's not as graphically powerful as the Series X, but that's still just like such a nice way to get into the Xbox ecosystem or even just to have Game Pass. Like if you don't have a super strong PC, but you want Game Pass because you like somebody doesn't have something that's comparable to that, right? And I really feel that whenever I play on my PS5, it's like, oh, I want to play this old game, but I can't. They, they actually awesome. had a, but Miranda, they actually had a note to your point on the Series S that it, uh, had more new users on the Xbox platform than any other Xbox platform, which was really, really cool to see. And that's exactly why, you know, pre-launch, I'm like, the S is a sleeper hit. Like, yep. this thing is going to tremendously help them. And uh, then we got the the clarity from Microsoft saying, oh, yeah, it did. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and, and that yeah. also, that's what the S is designed to do, to bring in new p people into the ecosystem at a, at that more affordable price. So it's, it is, its mission is successful thus far. Right. And I think that's fantastic. And they are still trying to give it as much um, graphical power as they can and frame rates. Like they're, they're still trying to bring you somewhere into that next generation without having to pay the full price. And especially again, not everyone cares about 4K. I know some people are like... <gasps> you know, grasping the pearls, but you know, <laughs> some people just don't like, like my twin sister, it's like true. Oh, I so a lot of people don't, well, what's, she, what's, doesn't, she doesn't yeah. care. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's, what's crazy is to your point, exactly. The Xbox series X is the shortest line between where you are and like a thousand games on game pass. So yeah. like it, it actually, it reminds me a lot of like back in 2006, 2007, when the 360 and the PS3 were were sort of vying for control. And then the Wii came out and there were shortages everywhere. Uh, and everybody had an Xbox or a PlayStation, but everybody had a Wii, right? If so, if you're if you're everybody's number two console, you are the number one console, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it's just it's such a it's such an awesome um I don't know, it's such an awesome strategy to see the big manufacturers come out with smaller, 
more budget, more affordable versions of their consoles so that you don't have to choose between one or the other. Like if you are a PlayStation 5 gamer and, and you buy a PS5, you can also get a Series X and Game Pass and have like an, <laughs> an insane amount of games to play immediately. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd still, the, 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 the journalism degree holder inside of me still still looks at this with a little bit of a skeptical eye like i'd love to have concrete numbers yes. here because yes. you know like liz pointing out more 3594 different games played spanning four generations well of course because <laughs> of the backwards compatibility so of course there are going to be more games played on the the series than on the previous generation consoles now that's not to take away from the incredible accomplishment that is backwards compatibility. They are leading the industry there, but it's like, but that's, you know, just for context, there is that. And then yeah. if we talked about the fact that the, the neither, none of the other Xboxes had global day one launches. And this one has, which again is an incredible testament to the entire Microsoft team from, you know, supply chain like everybody for uh, pulling that off in a in the middle of a global pandemic uh because again with without it making it a console war thing even sony didn't globally launch the ps5 the, right. the ps5 is uh, is out in europe right? yeah it's uh it's i think it's out like soon and it, 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 it might have just hit i think it's yeah. or this week Thursday. but it's not a global Stig launch so staggered release um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, major credit to Microsoft, but at the same point, I would hope they sold more consoles <laughs> because they were than previous generation Xboxes because they were in way more countries. So would love to have the concrete number. Um, you know, they've they've certainly, you know, you would hope that these things are good because of when you put these things in context. But nevertheless, uh, it seems like Microsoft is in a good position moving forward, even if they're they're not gonna quite be able to meet the demand with supply for another, you know, quarter and a half or so. Uh, we'll see. We'll obviously be keeping an eye on the stock situation. And again, as Miranda noted, follow at IGN deals on Twitter. They'll keep you up to date to the minute on when stock is refreshed at various retailers. Uh, okay, this is probably going to end up being another large chunk of the show because the, this the Bethesda topic... A, won't go away because we still, it's a huge topic. And B, we've got a, I think, a interesting update here. Again, from Microsoft's CTO, Tim Stewart, on the same event. He's commenting on Bethesda and the exclusivity of those games going forward. Quote, what we'll do in the long run is we don't have intentions of just pulling all of Bethesda content out of Sony or Nintendo or otherwise. But what we want is we want that content in the long run to either be first or better or best or pick your differentiated experience on our platforms. We will want Bethesda content to show up the best on our platforms. So... Destin, how do you parse? How how are you uh, interpreting this? I mean, like Microsoft's going to do whatever they want. They spent a lot of money on Bethesda. The deal's still not done, so they're not commenting on their plans specifically. Right. But um, yeah, the Xbox <laughs> is going to get some stuff, <laughs> no matter how you cut it. That that's what's going to happen. Period. Like I I just sort of like. The whole Bethesda thing, of course this is going to happen. I don't know why people are surprised. That's my reaction to it. Well, I mean, I think it's the debate here is interesting because when the deal first went through, a lot of people, including us, were sitting around talking about how, well, they things might not automatically just be cut off from Sony and, and Nintendo. And then we kind of moved, there were some other little comments. We kind of moved back to, well, maybe everything is going to be exclusive. And now there's this. So Miranda, what what do you make of this comment from their chief tech, technical officer? Fluffy. It's a fluffy yeah. comment. It's a perfect <laughs> word for it. I just feel like I'm like fluffing the cotton, you know, just punching up the pillow. <laughs> it's, a, it's just really long, so it's like, you know, he's just... You know, massage the pillow, get ready. 
Uh, yeah, of course, they're not going to pull the games. That would be very weird. Obviously, we've seen um, Microsoft's history with Mojang and what they did with Minecraft. Um, I will have you guys note that Minecraft Dungeons did come out on PlayStation 4, obviously, and Nintendo Switch as well, and, of course, both X the Xbox and PC. And it just uh, got so cross-platform for everything. You can yes. play with PlayStation people now on Minecraft Dungeons. So there is a precedent to be skeptical, but at the same time, like kind of as Dustin was saying, why wouldn't they want some of these next-gen games to be exclusive? Like... There is definitely a world where the next Elder Scrolls is exclusive. It's just the reality of what it is. And of course, like as we've all noted several times at this point, is that they don't want to comment on like what that's going to be because it sounds like those plans are just not set in stone yet. But I don't see, you know, you, you wouldn't see another publisher or I guess another one of the big three getting a big studio like this and then not making something of theirs exclusive. Like, why would you not do that? So that's, that's part of acquisitions, right? Um, it's business. Yeah. And I think maybe there's a chance one of them will be on all of the consoles, maybe like a year late or something. I don't yeah. even think so that, I don't even know if they would want to do that. Um, but I, I think I just keep looking at what they do with Mojang and, and give it that perspective. But the way Minecraft is established is different from other games, I would say. Yeah. And so I could see why they'd be willing to have that on other platforms. Because Minecraft is a platform. Is a platform. Yes. Yeah. Though Minecraft Dungeons is different from that. They did still publish in other places. So there's there's just a lot of... This could go a lot of ways, but I would err toward it being more exclusive than not. Yeah, if we if we take our personal feelings out about exclusivity and all that, think of it from a business perspective, right? Microsoft spent billions of dollars <laughs> to acquire this company. They're going to leverage that as much as they possibly can to bolster the Xbox platform. That's just what they're going to do business-wise. Now, if Sony wants to play nice and figure out some way that they come to an agreement so that like Starfield is able to launch on their platform day and date with Xbox, I'm sure they're going to be having those conversations, right? But they have tremendous leverage here by mm. purchasing this major studio. So... I think it's going to even the playing field. And I think that's going to be a good thing for everybody in the long run. Brandon, where do you sit with this? <clears throat> I'm kind of already tired of talking about this because <laughs> there's nothing else to say that we yeah. haven't said already outside yeah. of a few new, uh, let's call them crumbs of information uh, coming out of quotes. Uh, I will say, you know, when you boil the whole thing down to the core of it, Destin's 100% right. They bought a studio or they, they bought a publisher. <laughs> Uh, they are going to leverage it uh, the best way they can to uh, find success on you know their ecosystem, on their platform. Um, the interesting things to me from this new quote is sort of timed exclusive. It's the better experience or best experience. Those are all like sort of subtle nods at ways that they can really leverage this to their favor, whether that means, um, you know, I mean, one, they own it, right? So they're, the marketing deals are already there. They're, they're not even marketing deals. They'll just advertise for, for Xbox. So you've already got that in the bag, right? Elder Scrolls Six looks best, plays best on Xbox Series X. Regardless if that's true, Bless that's you. the commercial that's going to happen, right? Yeah. Bless you, Miranda. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, outside of that, uh, you know, first tells me, you know, timed exclusives are definitely on the table. I, I, I think... We all kind of saw that coming originally as well. But what it really tells me is Bethesda is going to sell a lot of Xbox Series S's for Microsoft. Because if we do go the time exclusive route and Elder, Scro the Elder Scrolls Next, I can't say that, Elder Scrolls Six uh, is a timed exclusive for the Series X, waiting a year or dropping a couple hundred bucks uh, a few years after the console's already launched. So you might be seeing price reductions there already. Um, Dropping a couple hundred bucks on a Series S and a Game Pass subscription means you can play Elder Scrolls Six tomorrow. Yeah. That seems like something that is not outside the realm of believable for a lot of people who aren't in the Microsoft infrastructure already. So, um, you know, I could see timed exclusives work. To Destin's point again, if you're leveraging this to do the most for your business as possible, I think not selling, like completely omitting a platform is silly in the long run. Um, Having said that, again, totally understand the idea of exclusivity, but a timed exclusive with then coming to PlayStation a year later or something seems maybe like the best of both worlds in that situation, you know? 
you you drive you drive purchases to the Series S and Game Pass, and then you know you open it up to the other platforms who you know aren't interested in joining the Microsoft platform. And that's not that's not to even talk about the fact that you know we saw that report about the whatever it is, the Chromecast for Xbox or something. Right. And we had joked a lot about doing some sort of like web browser based um, Game Pass solution for the PlayStation if they didn't want to play ball and allow that app on on their platform. <laughs> so, you know, that that doesn't even account. Like there might be a solution next year or the year after where you drop a hundred bucks on an Xcast or a Chromecast or whatever it's going to call it. Plug it into your TV and just play through xCloud that way. So... I don't know. There's there's a ton of different possibilities. There's a ton of different things they can do. We're not going to know anything until Bethesda's ready to talk about Starfield, which I believe is the first one coming. And um, like, what if what if Starfield's an MMO and that only launches on Xbox? I, I don't I don't necessarily you think Starfield's think an MMO. Well, no, I'm just saying hypothetically because like Final Fantasy is still a PlayStation centric platform and it's also yeah. on PC. Let's say Starfield's an Xbox centric platform and it's also on PC because of Game Pass. You know, everything comes to Xbox and PC. The idea that they would be losing out on money just doesn't hold water with me. It's like saying World of Warcraft lost money because it never launched on a console. That's just ridiculous. Like it made billions of dollars and it continues to make billions of dollars and has for its entire life cycle. So there is a reality where, yeah, okay, you have, I don't know, a 5 million install base of Xboxes that are able to only play Bethesda games, right? And it's even more if you go backwards. So they have this massive install base. Do they need Sony to become profitable? Absolutely not. No, not so at all. What is, what is Sony going to bring to the table to sweeten the pot enough that they're like, yeah, okay, let's play ball. I don't even I don't even think it's Sony needs to bring something to the table. I think it's looking at another distribution platform. It's why games go on sale, right? Because you miss the you miss the window to buy it at full price. Um, fervor or excitement about the game has started to do its natural decline over time. And so you put it on sale and you see spikes in sales. Yes, you're not getting the full price for the game, but you're still converting sales. So looking at other distribution platforms after the fact, um, like a year a, out. Yeah, yeah. It's just a smart way to, you know, open up another stream of revenue for something that's already had its time in the sun. And to, to your point about World of Warcraft, you're absolutely right. A game as a service is a different product than a video game, right? I mean, yes, they, they're both video games, but a game as a service is something that's intended to keep you here for a long time. So I totally agree. If Starfield's like an MMO, it wouldn't well, make it's sense. Not, I don't, we don't think it is. There's no, yeah, no, no, I no. Don't think but it is hypothetically, a, hypothetically. A game as a service is an example, which have honestly, since Destiny, not done well. So Yeah, no, I know. It's, it's, it's hard. It's really hard these days. We saw with Marvel's Avengers. We obviously saw with, you know, with Anthem. It's really hard to sustain a game as a service. Um, so it would make sense unless cross play is going to become the ubiquitous thing we all hope it is. It would make sense to keep everyone in one location, right? To to keep them in your ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my take on this I, is it's it sounds to me like they're going to aim. They're probably going to do a hybrid model that it's yeah. there's it's going to be different situations for different games. But here's the, here's the thing: the when I think about this. I could see it going in one of two opposite ways. I could see Microsoft keeping the big stuff like Starfield, like Elder Scrolls 6, like Doom 3, whatever, you know, 3 Eternal, <laughs> whatever it's going to no, end up being. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Please can't undo that now. That happened. But, you know, that kind of stuff. I could see the big, the big triple A stuff being exclusive. T totally exclusive to Xbox platforms and PC and never coming to PlayStation. And then the smaller tier stuff um, being multi-platform or timed exclusive. But I could also see it the opposite way where the smaller stuff is never sees PlayStation. Yeah. You got, you know, these cooler, smaller things, you know, like again, if it weren't already signed on with Sony, like the Ghostwire Tokyos, the death loops of the world. And then the bigger stuff is the timed exclusive that, that eventually does get to multi-platform. So I could totally, I feel like there's a case to be made either way, you know, for you, for you to either keep the big stuff on Xbox and, and spread the little stuff to other platforms for, a, you know, when you know that there's, it needs more chances of success or the opposite. So 
we'll see what happens. But this story continues. It's certainly not going to go away anytime soon. And and as uh, as either Destin or Brandon duly noted, the the acquisition doesn't even go through until early next year. So we've got we've got a long time yet to to track this story. Uh, all right. I think finally this week, real quick, uh, Halo Infinite. We haven't heard from it for a little while, but it seems we are going to hear something soon. 343's community director, Brian Gerard, who, by the way, goes all the way back to the Bungie days. I, I know Brian well. He's a great guy. He went on Reddit and posted this, quote, Full disclosure, we don't have anything planned for the Game Awards, but are hoping to offer at least a high-level update within the next few weeks so we can kind of restart this journey together after the holidays. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a little surprised. I thought 343 would really lay low after the way everything went and the delay and the we don't know when it's coming out i thought they would lay low until the game was totally rock solid pretty much ready to go and then they would they would go from there are uh miranda are you surprised at all that that microsoft the 343 and uh, is going to start talking a little bit here soon not really i think so far, what I've seen from their game plan after Halo 5, it's to be sort of transparent with like saying, hey, we are listening to, here are the things that we're going to do, here are the things that we are doing. Uh, and I think they needed to make that statement just because, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of felt like a little hole in my heart without having Halo Infinite launch. I was just yeah, like, yeah. oh, we man, I could be playing a new Halo right now. <laughs> oh, man. But so, so it's... It's sad to not have that when that was something we were really expecting. So having some news to kind of, I guess, it's it's weird to say it, just continue being excited for what Halo can be is really important to me. Like, if we didn't hear anything for the rest of the year about Halo, I'd be really disappointed. Um, I just want to know what's happening and, like, kind of get an estimate to what they're feeling. If it's going to be a lot longer of a time for development or if it's just, you know, early next year. So I right. think getting that gauge is really important rather than just waiting until it's done. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm excited that they are going to be talking and I, I hope I look forward to hearing what they have to say, but yeah, I'm a little surprised. Destin. I think it's going to be uh, multiplayer focused. I think that's what they're going to talk about because a lot of people are curious. I think multiplayer yeah. it's, you get a little bit more forgiveness than they do with the campaign. I think there's an expectation with a campaign reveal, like the one that they showed. And uh, that, that's what I think it'll be. I think you're right. There's, there, there's no, yeah, there's no yeah. expectation set yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll that's, be. That's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, you might, you, I think you might be onto something there. So, uh, as soon as Brian and the the team at three four three are are ready to to talk, we will eagerly hear what they have to say. And on that note, let's move to the loot box. Kellyak thirteen, if I'm pronouncing that username correctly. Uh, has a thought on Avengers, which Destin just mentioned, and sort of the the ex content exclusivity strategy uh, and, and how that may affect things going forward. Go ahead, Kiliak13. Hey, guys. Love the show. And my question for you is regarding games as a service. You mentioned uh, Avengers that reportedly cost Square Enix 60-something million uh, due to not selling very well. And I'm wondering if on top of all the glitches and such, uh, the fact that there was a lot of PlayStation exclusive content and that got announced before launch, including Spider-Man as a character, if that may have had a significant impact on that. And I'm asking that because, you know, maybe that's a sign that this is not a nice strategy to go for. It certainly works for PlayStation, but it didn't work at all for Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics. So what do you think about that? Thank you very much. What a really interesting, that is a very thought-provoking loot box question there. Destin, you are a, an expert on this genre, uh, and I want to go to you on a, on this one. What do you think here? Me and Miranda. Miranda plays D2 in the, the, the shared true. world shooters. Um, I, I don't think the issue was the Spider-Man exclusivity. Well, we had a really negative reaction to that, and I think the internet largely was like, don't do this, Destiny did this, and this was bad. Why are you doing this again? I don't think that's what happened. I think I think Avengers had a, a pretty solid campaign, and the problem actually lied in with their um, what do they refer to these games as now? Games as a service model. It just wasn't compelling to grind through the same because, like, basically, it had the same problem that 
Anthem had. There were very few ways to power up. In Destiny, they at least had multiple avenues for you to power up, even at, la at launch. But then you would hit the raid wall to like hit that cap, and the raid is super difficult, compelling content that was aspirational. In this, it was literally like just do one thing over and over again, and uh, everything felt very samey, and there just wasn't enough variety there. So I don't think the Spider-Man exclusivity was the issue. I think it was more just the gameplay model, personally. Yeah, yeah. I think as much as I would like for for Kiliak there to be correct because i would love for the industry to go yeah you know what maybe we shouldn't do that stuff anymore i just feel like avengers and, and i mean no disrespect to crystal dynamics but it just seemed like it never connected people with people right from when it was announced it just seemed you know it never kind of hit well and they they never seemed to sort of find that spark the way that a destiny did or mm -hmm. on the other side of the like the marvel side like a like spider-man ps4 did so uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see if, if publishers keep doing this stuff going forward. All right, we've just got a few minutes. No left. one else gets the comment. No, <laughs> that's, I, I'm not going to move on. Right we we have a programming block, and that's how this works. And I know people. The final some word, people are, Gary. Why don't you just keep? Why are? You, why don't you just keep talking forever? It's like, well, unfortunately, it's just production <laughs> is a thing, and we have to adhere to the rules. Sometimes, sometimes we break the rules, but. <laughs> just every now and again. Pick your battles. <laughs> exactly right. Yes, Brandon. Uh, so we'll do a, a quick rapid fire unlock block trivia here. We won't really talk about it much, but this this is not only an excellent question from uh, Rick Bostian, but uh, a very timely one, given that mm -hmm. the Series X and S have just launched. He asks, with the Series S and X out now, people have uh, cross-generation gaming on the brain. With that in mind, these four games appeared early in the life of the 360 while also having original Xbox versions. So we're going back a couple generations here. He says three of these games were nearly identical across the original Xbox and 360 generation, but one was practically a different game on each respective system. So was that totally different game Gun? Peter Jackson's King Kong, the official game of the movie, which, yes, was its correct title. Good job, Rick. That was uh, that's that's ace right there. What a title! That's Ubisoft for you. Uh, <laughs> Splinter Cell Double Agent or Tom uh, Tom Tom Hawk's American Wasteland. That's Tony's <laughs> cousin. <laughs> Tony <laughs> Hawk's American Wasteland. So three of those were basically just the same across either those of those Xbox generations, but one was like a different game on each system. Uh, I. I know this one. I'll be curious if you guys do, because I, I live through this uh, very vividly. Miranda, do you know this one? No. Take a I, shot. Was eight, I was <laughs> small. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna work through this, all right, with the power of deduction. I love I love this this part of the of the question. Go, 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 go. I'm dying okay, to know. So good. Cool name. Very straightforward. I wanna know what that game is. I have no idea. It's just like gun? That's really your name? Okay. <laughs> you said it. You said it like I had a question mark. <laughs> Gun. <laughs> um, and so then the other three, you would expect to have some sort of parody across platforms. So I think it's got to be one of those three. It's not gun. Gun solid. Gun knows what to do, and it's one word. Um, but I think. <laughs> Of says these? what it does, and it does what it says. <laughs> it guns. <laughs> of these other three. I'm kind of torn between B or D. Okay. And I feel, I mean, obviously someone's out there feel like, I know this answer, she's wrong. But we're going to go with Tony Hawk's American Wasteland. Okay. Uh, Destin, do you know this one? <laughs> I don't know it. I think it's D, and I'll go with D. Okay, so agreeing with Miranda. Brandon, how about you? I actually, this question terrifies me because I have played all four of these games, and I don't know it. What's good? Um, what's that? Was gun cool? Gun was actually really yeah, cool. Red Dead. Yeah. It's yeah. Red Dead. yeah. Yeah. Well, long okay. before Red Dead. Yeah. 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 Like the bullet time. It, it, um, the closest thing I could think to it these days is like Call of War as oh. Gunslinger from 2013. I remember this. I remember well, that. Okay. cheesy though. Sorry. Well, Gunslinger wasn't cheesy. Get out of here. Call of War as is a little, there's a little. Yeah, yes. Call of War as the series is super, <laughs> super cheesy, especially three cartel. Don't play that game. But Gunslinger is very, very good. Like, it's very good. Um, anyway, can I also just say that I would play the hell out of Tom Hawk's American Wasteland? I feel yeah. like it's 
Tony's cousin from like Jersey, you know, four kids. <laughs> he works in hazmat. He's just a blue collar dude trying to get through. Welcome to my wasteland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, his day starts at four, you know. <laughs> Uh, All right, we got to roll here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, I think, I don't want to follow the crowd, so I'm going to say B, Peter Jackson's King Kong, the official game of the movie, because I do remember that game had a bunch of crazy stuff in it, like fire and, like, spreading fire, and then there were some other, some other features that were in that game as well. And I, it it actually was surprisingly good, but I don't, I don't remember if one of them, similar to how Nemesis System wasn't on the 360 and it was on the Xbox One. Right. um, so I, I, I think it might have been a situation like that, but I honestly have no clue. Uh, also, an easy 1,000 achievement points. All you got to do is finish the game. That's yeah. it. And you'll get all 1,000 points. Well, uh, Brandon is up two points on both Miranda and Destin. It is nine to seven to seven. Mm-hmm. And there will be no update to the scoring this week. <laughs> because God damn. the answer was Killer Cell Double Agent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ubisoft. Ubisoft Shanghai did the 360 version, which was the lead skew. But secretly, the better version was the original Xbox version, which was like the same story. You know, if you just basically handed the same design doc and outline to two Mm -hmm. different teams, they would come up with two different things. And that's what happened. Ubisoft Montreal did uh, Double Agent on the original Xbox, and it is regarded as the better game. And they are very, very Why did I say Tony Hawk? I can't believe that's an actual (laughs) thing. That's basically Uh, like a game of telephone, but with development budgets. Yes, That's insane to me. Great great job stumping the panel. Uh, That is an excellent question. If you've got a trivia question, email it to me, unlocked at IGN.com. And with that, we've got a roll for Miranda, Brandon, and Destin. We will be here next week. It is our uh, Thanksgiving holiday week here in the United States. Uh, but we're here for the first half of the week, so there will be a podcast next week. Join us then, and in the meantime, happy gaming.